हेलो फ्रेंड्स एंड वेलकम टू माई चैनल सो आई एम हियर टूडे विद अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन ऑफ केमिस्ट्री दैट आर केमिकल बॉन्ड्स रियली प्योर आयनिक और प्योर कोवेलेंट इज देर एनी थिन लाइन ऑफ डिफरेंस बिटवीन वेन टू कॉल अ बॉन्ड एज कोवेलेंट और वेन टू कॉल अ बॉन्ड एज आयोनिक और देर इज नो एक्चुअली एनी बाउंड्री बिटवीन दीज टू थिंग्स एंड a covalent bond may have ionic nature as well as ionic bond may have covalent nature so let's get back to some high school chemistry what your high school teacher would have told you are these facts really right or not let's have a look at that so in chemistry we have uh, at least three different type of strong bonds which have very high energy of the order of approximately 100 kilocalories per mole the first bond includes covalent bond you might have seen some of the strongest materials of the world that is diamond is established because of these covalent bonds between carbon and carbon atoms now how do these covalent bonds originate you learned in high school that most of the atoms have got nuclei and all the nuclei are surrounded by electron clouds so when these electron clouds overlap they tend to get shared between two atoms and that results in the formation of what we call as covalent bond on the other hand material like table salt which when it is present in the air or vacuum is also a very strong solid and that is established because of another strong bond that's called ionic bond now how do ionic bonds are formed these bonds are formed when one of the element is having a requirement of obtaining one electron another element is having ability to donate an electron in order to complete their stable orbital configuration or noble gas configuration and that results in complete loss of one electron from an atom and acquisition by another atom so the one which acquires that electron is known as an ion it gets negative charge and the one that donates the electron becomes positively charged and that's called cation so these two ions remain associated with strong electrostatic interactions but we will realize later that these ionic interactions are dependent on dielectric constant so they may not always be strong if you change the solvent solvents like pure water may have high dielectric constant and that might make them very weak that's the reason why table salt might get dissolved and all the ions might get dissociated when you put that in water anyways that's the topic of uh, yet another discussion i'll i'll come up with another video for discussing the dielectric constants and effect of these things but the third type of strong bond that is found in matter is somewhere in very strong metals like copper so these kind of bonds are called as metallic bonds now what is the unique feature of metallic bonds that electron clouds of many atoms are actually shared so unlike the covalent bond which is between two atoms you can say this is a covalent bond between many atoms where one of the electron can be shared with this and then same electron can be shared here so there will be a very quick network very dense network of electron around all the atoms and that kind of situation will be called as metallic bond that explains some of the very important physical properties of metals like malleability ductility lusher strength all these things are explained because of metallic bonds but now a very important question are these classification schemes or these types very distinct means a compound which is said to have covalent bond cannot have this kind of nature or a molecule that is having ionic bond cannot have this nature so that's the question are these bonds 100% pure means if you say sodium chloride is an ionic compound and the bond between sodium and chlorine ions is ionic i object to that i would say no it's not 100% ionic there is some covalent nature in that if you say that water is a covalent compound and the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is covalent i would still object to that and i would say no it's not 100% covalent there is ionic component in it so that's the discussion all about we are going to look at uh, this conventional trivial thing that we learnt in your high school how these things may be 
mere myths and how we can improve our understanding about the boundaries between these kind of bonds and later at the end of this presentation you will realize that there is no a, a, a specific type of boundary between these kind of bonds but there can be covalent nature in ionic, ionic nature in covalent, metallic nature in ionic and ionic nature in metallic and so on. So let's start our discussion that how the covalent nature of ionic bond was first described. So the covalent nature of ionic bond was first described uh, with the help of these uh, rules. Now if you look at this uh, simple atom where you have an ionic bond as you know that ionic bond will have one negatively charged ion called anion another is cation that will be positively charged and they will be connected together by electrostatic interaction. But we should remember one thing in our mind that this anion now has got negatively charged it will be able to pull the nuclei whereas this cation will pull the electron cloud towards itself. So the ability to pull the electron cloud of anion by cation is called as the polarizability. On the other hand the ability to shift the electrons on the other side by anion is called its, its polarizing power. Now because of this an ionic bond can turn into this kind of structure where we cannot distinguish whether it is a covalent bond or ionic bond. So an ionic bond can appear like a covalent bond when there is a high polarization. Now it was uh, Casimir Fazan in 1923 who first described three fundamental rules to determine the ionic nature of a chemical bond, uh, sorry covalent nature of a, co a chemical bond by three fundamental set of rules. The first is greater the charge of cation, greater is the covalent character of ionic bond. So more is charge on this particular ion more will be the covalent nature because it will be pulling it towards it and it will be drifting it and making it more like covalent bond. Second rule was smaller the size of cation. So if it is smaller the polarizability will be more and in that case that will tend to make it more covalent. The third rule if the cations with the same charge and same size they have d orbital if the electrons are present in d orbital it is true for most of the transition elements that is d block elements then those elements will have greater covalent character in them. So these three fundamental rules explain that how an ionic bond or a bond that is looking like ionic can be covalent or how a chemical bond can be deciphered to have covalent character in it. Now let's look at this with the help of some of the examples. So these are the summary of Fazan's rules where you can say if the cation is a small, anion is large, charge is more and if there are d electrons then that will tend to make it more covalent. If the cation is large, anion is a small and there is little charge and there is no d electrons then that will lead to the ionic shift or kind of ionic bond. So if I ask you one simple question that what do you say about these molecules? sodium fluoride, sodium chloride, sodium bromide and sodium iodide. You learnt in high school that sodium chloride is ionic compound. But if I say that which one of them is more ionic, which one of them is more like covalent, how would you like to arrange them? So this will be the order of their nature. Now let's talk about which one will be more ionic and more covalent on the basis of Fajan's rules. We will see here that the size of cation here is almost same. That means positively charged ions are of same size, it is all sodium everywhere. But if you look at the anion size, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine, they are successively increasing. So just look at the rule, what is changing? The size of anion is increasing. So large anion, that means this side there is more covalent character. So we can say that on this side NaF it is most ionic, on the other side NaI is covalent. So we can say NaCl is less ionic than sodium fluoride. So again what I started with that there is nothing like 100% ionic compound. There is nothing like 100% ionic bond. It has some partial covalent character in it. 
Now, if you if I ask you another question, arrange these molecules in the increasing order of their covalent strengths: lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, potassium fluoride, rubidium fluoride, and cesium fluoride. What will be your answer? So let's look into this again. Now, here what you see, the unlike the previous example where the cations were of same size, here anions are of same size. But if you look at the cation size, cesium is larger, rubidium is smaller, potassium is smaller, and then sodium much smaller, and then lithium is smallest. So now if you look at this, if, if the anions are having a decreasing size, if in, the, in this case, uh, sorry, cations are having a decreasing size, this is the largest cation, and anions are of same size. So what will happen if the cation is large? That will have more ionic character. So you have on the left hand side cesium fluoride having maximum ionic character whereas lithium fluoride has got the maximum covalent character. So despite the fact that in order to obtain an octet fluorine always require one electron and cesium, rubidium, potassium, sodium and lithium have the tendency to donate one electron it is not necessary that all of them will form 100% covalent or 100% ionic bond. So this rule also explains that which one will be more covalent and which one will be more ionic. Now finally, what do you say about mercury chloride and calcium chloride? The size of chlorine is identical, size of mercury and calcium is also very much similar. So in that case, how would you answer that which one will be a covalent compound and which one will be an ionic compound? So we have to go for rule number three of Fajan where he says that if the size of cations and anions are same then you have to look for the presence of d electrons so mercury belongs to d block element and the electron in the valence shell are present in d uh, subshell so if there are d electrons then it is likely to be more covalent in nature so you can say among these two calcium chloride and mercury chloride you will have this molecule as ionic and this molecule as covalent so this was the first fundamental rule with the help of which it was possible to distinguish uh, which compound are likely to have more ionic character and which compound are likely to have more covalent character. But again, there is no demarcation, there is no boundary line that this compound can be called as pure ionic or this compound can be called as pure covalent. So that's what I am stressing upon. Now let's look into another aspect. There was uh, another person, Linus Pauling, who worked on this area and who gave another uh, idea of ionic character of covalent chemical bond. So if you look at a chemical bond, if it is a covalent in, uh, covalent in nature, and if the single atom has ability to pull the shared pair of electron that can slightly polarize this bond and that can lead to the development of slight negative or slight positive charge. So in this situation, you cannot say that this is a covalent bond or ionic bond but this will be partially covalent and partially ionic. Similarly an ionic bond which appear to have an absolute positive and absolute negative charge that may not necessarily be in this arrangement but there can be pulling of the electron clouds and that can also turn in this format making this bond partially covalent and partially ionic. So this was a person Linus Pauling. He won Nobel Prize for two times, one for chemistry in 1954 and then another Nobel Prize for peace. So in 1923, he came up with the concept of electronegativity and he introduced that as a measure of tendency of an atom to attract the shared pair of electron. So this was given by symbol chi and higher the value of chi, higher the value of electronegativity, more is the power to pull the shared pair of electrons. This is affected by atomic number and the distance at which the valence cell resides from the charged nucleus. So larger the atomic number, more will be the electronegativity and, and, and the, the valence cell electrons which are present. So all these values will be describing the electronegativity. Different elements in the periodic table have different electronegativities. Fluorine has got the highest electronegativity. So Linus Pauling also gave electronegativity scale uh, on which fluorine was given the highest value of 4.0. Now in order to find out the percent ionic character, he gave a formula that's mu by ER into 100, where mu is observed dipole moment of a bond. So if there is a bond, there is a development of partial negative and partial positive charge. 
this will be called as dipole and there will be an observed dipole moment that can be given by the charge and distance by which they are separated it's a vector quantity so you can calculate the dipole moment and then you have to divide it by er this er is the dipole moment during the complete charge transfer so if there is a complete charge transfer like this situation so in that situation whatever is the dipole moment that can be written by er and if you multiply that by 100 you get the percent percentage ionic character of the bond so if you want to find out the percentage ionic character without calculating dipole moment there was another relation that was given by linus pauling which says that 1 minus e raised to power 1 minus 4 into chi a minus chi b that's uh, electronegativity difference between the two atoms bonded atoms multiplied by 100 so you can get the percent ionic character by using this formula as well now let's look into this with the help of some example and let me first talk about sodium chloride as such does it have 100% ionic character or the bond between Na and Cl is absolutely ionic or does it also have some covalent nature in it? So as I mentioned, this can be calculated by using this formula, percent ionic character is equal to 1 minus E, 1 by 4, chi A minus chi B into 100. And we will require electronegativity values for all. So we will need electronegativity value of Na and Cl. These are the values of all elements on the periodic table which were given by Linus Pauling. So we have electronegativity values coming from this table. As you can see, chlorine has got electronegativity value of 3 which has been placed here and sodium has got electronegativity value of 0.9. Now what we need to do is we need to calculate the difference between these two and the difference of electronegativity is 3.0 minus 0.9 that's 2.1. So if you place this value in this formula, you're likely to get 67% ionic character and remaining 33% of covalent character. That means, I again stress upon, sodium chloride is not 100% ionic. It's only 67% ionic, whereas 33% is covalent nature in sodium chloride. Now we can take uh, uh, this whole thing and we can keep in this formula and we can simply make a table out of it and uh, that table can act as a reference so if there is a difference of 0.2 percent ionic character is 1 if it is electronegativity difference is 1 percent ionic character is 22 at electronegativity difference of 2 percent ionic character is 63 and so on so you can make use of this table for a reference or you can directly use this formula to calculate the percent ionic and percent covalent character in a chemical bond. Let's have a look at some other examples, cesium fluoride. So how would you calculate ionic percentage of cesium chloride bond? You will again use the same formula. You're going to use the values of chi CS and chi F, that's 0.7 and 4.0 from the same periodic table, and the difference will be 3.3. So at 3.3 difference, there is 92% ionic character and 8% covalent character. So that's highly ionic, but I won't say that it's absolutely ionic. Sodium chloride is relatively less ionic than cesium fluoride. It has almost one third covalent nature in it. Now, if you look at another compound, calcium tetra carbon tetrachloride, that's CCl4, again, you can use the same type of formula where electronegativity of carbon is 2.5, electronegativity of chlorine is 3.0 and the difference is 0.5. So at the difference of 0.5, you only have 6% of ionic character, whereas remaining 94% is covalent. So this compound would have covalent nature. Mostly people will call this as a covalent compound, but I would say that it has 94% covalent character, but still it has 6% ionic character in it. So this is how we make use of the Linus Pauling's rule, Fazan's rules in order to describe that what is the percentage of covalent nature and what is the percentage of ionic nature in a given bond. So let us now look into one more concept that was developed by two brilliant chemists, Anton Edward Arkel and Arnold Albert Kettler. In 1947, they 
developed a relationship between two variables and plotted a graph between absolute electronegativity values on x-axis and they calculated this by adding the electronegativities and taking the average of electronegativities of two bonded atoms. On the y-axis on the other hand they took the electronegativity difference between the two atoms which are bonded together. So when they did so and when they plotted these values for variety of compounds that are found in nature they obtained a triangle. And in the triangle the interesting thing was uh, that values which are on the extreme left hand side they were representing mostly metallic compounds or metals those things which are on extreme right hand side they were representing covalent compounds and those things or those compounds which were on the top they were representing mostly ionic compounds. So that gave us an idea about how to determine the percentage of metallic or covalent. So something which is uh, midway here that would be having 50% metallic nature and 50% covalent nature. Something at the midway here will have 50% metallic nature and 50% ionic nature. Something, something which is here that will have 50% of ionic nature and 50% of covalent nature. So let's try to understand this arkel kettler triangle in more detail. As I told you that we have electronegativity difference on y-axis and absolute electronegativity on x-axis. We can have certain compounds that will fall in this area. And in this area what do you see? This will be representing metallic compounds. On the other hand, this part is mostly representing covalent compounds and this part of the triangle would be representing ionic compounds. So if I take a couple of examples here, let's say this is one position of a compound. So what you observe here that this compound or this molecule would have very little or no electronegativity difference but at the same time it will also have low absolute electronegativity. So atoms like sodium or metals like sodium, when they will form metal, they will be bond of course between sodium and sodium. But since sodium has low electronegativity and it also has zero electronegativity difference or low electronegativity difference, this will be positioned somewhere here. And as it is in the extreme left, this would be representing a very high percentage of metallic character. Now if we take example of a molecule which is placed here, so this is again not having any electronegativity difference but it is having moderate absolute electronegativity. So let's say this is hydrogen molecule. The electronegativity of hydrogen is somewhere around 2 but two hydrogen atoms since they don't have any electronegativity difference, they are uh, here positioned here on the y-axis which represent electronegativity difference of 0. So that will be having uh, like 50% metallic character and 50% covalent character. But if you look at elements or compounds like chlorine gas, so chlorine gas uh, which will not be having any electronegativity difference but its absolute electronegativity would be relatively high, they are likely to form bond which will have more covalent nature. So things which are going on the right side but still they are on the lower part they are not on towards upwards they will be either metallic in nature or they will be covalent in nature. But let's now take another example of a molecule which is placed here in this triangle. So what do you say about this molecule? This has got some electronegativity difference little higher than one and it also has absolute electronegativity of nearly 2.5 and this molecule is water. So there is electronegativity difference between O and H and also there is absolute electronegativity value of H2O molecule. So this is placed somewhere here. Now what do you say about the bonds in water? Are they covalent or ionic? I would say they are midway between ionic and covalent. Not absolutely ionic neither absolutely covalent. So it's partially ionic and partially covalent compound almost 50-50% of the ionic and covalent character. Similarly, if you move to this position of the triangle, this position represents that there is high electronegativity difference 
and moderate absolute electronegativity. So if there is moderate absolute electronegativity and there is high electronegativity difference, those compounds would have more ionic character in them. And this is the position occupied by sodium chloride. So you can still see that sodium chloride is not at the top. That means it is not a pure ionic compound. It has some covalent character and that was also demonstrated during our previous discussion on Pauling's rule where we determined that it has almost 33% of covalent character in it. So this is how we make use of arkel catalytic triangles in order to determine that what is the percentage of ionic, metallic or covalent character in a molecule and what kind of bonding is likely to present in that particular molecule. So let's have an extended version of this particular triangle here. We can have plenty of compounds plotted on this graph and we can see that cesium fluoride which is on the top that has got a very high ionic character in it. Cesium chloride is somewhere here and then other compounds like lithium hydride and uh, lithium bromide these are over here whereas water is somewhere here, hydrogen bromide is here and all the elemental molecules which have uh, identical atoms in them like lithium metal, strontium, magnesium, aluminium, all these things you can say they are metallic. But not only metals have metallic bonds, uh, compounds like rubidium and strontium compounds, cesium and sodium compounds, strontium and magnesium compounds, they can also have a very great metallic interaction or metallic bonding between them. On the other hand, if you look at the extreme right side, molecules like oxygen, O2F, chlorine fluorine compounds, xenon hexafluoride, sulfur dioxide, these compounds are having good covalent nature. But there is also a partial metallic nature and partial ionic nature in them. So you can explore more about the arkel catalar triangle and whenever you have doubt in your mind that whether a compound has ionic bond or it has a covalent bond or it has a metallic bond, this triangle would be a great help. And with the help of this, you can comment upon the exact nature of the bond that is present in any molecule. So with this submission, I close the video now. And I would say as a take home message that there is absolutely nothing like pure ionic bond or pure covalent bond or pure metallic bond. But there is always a slight degree of another kind of bond present in it. So there is no specific boundary or no perfect boundary between these three kind of bonding. Rather, there is a gradient of ionic to covalent, covalent to metallic, metallic to ionic. And this gradient can be explained with the help of the electronegativity difference between them. Thank you very much.